Stacey, who is Endowed Professor of Soybean Microtechnology at the U University of M Missouri. Gary's research focuses on the symbiosis between specific bacteria and the host plant soya beans and how this relates to the induction of plant innate immunity. Gary is involved in many associations, including the American Society for the Advancements of Science, the American Society of Plant Biology, and others. He told me before this he doesn't like long introductions, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Gary, who's going to present on the subject, Potential of Biological Nitrogen Fixation to Impact Sustainable Global Food Production. Thank you, Gary. see if I can figure out how to use this thing. Um, I also want to thank uh, Maurice for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come up here. I've had a chance to come up here a few times. I'm actually tempted to buy a house here in case the election in November goes the, goes the wrong way. Um, and um, although I am very grateful for the opportunity to talk, um, I'm not grateful for the opportunity to follow Ruth. She's, uh, she's quite an act to follow. So. Um, I do, though, appreciate the fact that uh, biological nitrogen fixation is given such a prominent position in this meeting because it's not a normal situation for these types of uh, food-focused uh, meetings. Uh, the picture that you see in front of you uh, shows uh, soybean. It's a little blurry, and I apologize for that, but it basically shows soybean, and those that are dark green are inoculated with rhizobium, and those that are yellowish are, are not inoculated. So you can see the impact of biological nitrogen fixation on growth. Um, um, since I was one of the first speakers in the meeting, I thought I would show a few slides to define the problem, and I, I know I'm kind of um, sp speaking to the converted here, but there may be a few in the audience. So here's the kind of trends that we see you know, since the 60s. The, we all talk about the growth in um, population, the need for increased uh, uh, food production, the, the uh, increase in food consumption, and also a huge increase in the application of fertilizer nitrogen. And, the, of course, the reason why we're here is that a large percentage of the population is undernourished. Um, I'll remind you of this uh, cover story from Time in 2005, which lists the five things that we could do to end poverty. And now, a decade later, I would, I would argue that there's been very little progress, at least in, number one, boosting agriculture. The amount of new money that's going into agriculture is still relatively limited. And I think Ruth made comment to the fact that uh, in the recent budget, if I understood it correctly, in Kenya, there was really no increase for funding uh, for agriculture. So unfortunately, and especially in the United States, many of our politicians view agriculture as a situation of excess and not a, a situation of limitation. Uh, and there, I think many of our politicians and also public in general think that the, that the cost of inaction is much less than the cost of action. And yet we see here, this is a slide that probably many of you have seen from a, a review by Nina Federoff that shows the food price index versus occasions of food riots across the world. And so the price of, there is a price for inaction and that's social unrest as well as cost in dollars and, and so on and so forth. And so uh, sitting and doing nothing uh, actually does cost us quite a lot. Um, again, there's a huge need for increasing food production. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, you know, I deal with a lot with soybean farmers in the U.S., and I think soybean farmers in the U.S. would like to think that the food problem could be solved by export alone. But here we see that, um, that most food production is actually consumed in country. So for us to have a significant impact on food production, we have to actually be able to work in those countries and improve their local, local production. <clears throat> and of course, we all see the trends that, the, um, uh, that we're actually doing very well as, as far as breeding and increasing uh, crops and agronomic price, um, practices. <clears throat> but from the standpoint of the amount of arable land, there's really no significant increase and that, and then again, we see these spike, spikes in, uh, in uh, food prices. And then when we look at production, we see that probably the two most limiting things as far as production, and that's shown here on the right-hand side of this slide, is water and nitrogen. <clears throat> and, um, and so uh, it's, it's difficult to produce water or do much about water, um, but we can do something about, about nitrogen. And of course, here we see that in high-income countries, the amount of nitrogen fertilizer is, is increased, but pretty much leveled off. But of course, in low-income countries, there's been a significant increase in the use of nitrogen fertilizer. <clears throat> 
Um, and it's not an accident that on the left-hand side of this, uh, this, this figure you can see that the green line, which shows the increase in synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use, is almost parallel with the increase in population. And we see that, that um, um, in a lot of cases that the increase that we've seen in crop production has actually been breeding for nitrogen response. Uh, and that's certainly true, for instance, in the case of rice. <clears throat> and we also see that a large increase on the, on the um, I guess, on my right, I guess you're right too, um, that a lot of the increase in crop production has come in the grasses and not, for instance, in the pulses, which was mentioned, uh, which was mentioned earlier. Um, uh, so, um, so as we breed for increased nitrogen response, there is significant evidence that we're breeding out the ability to interact with beneficial bacteria, including beneficial bacteria that can fix nitrogen. And we have the global nitrogen fertilizer distribution problem and that, for instance, if you see here in, uh, I'm sure that green that goes up into Canada is largely uh, here in Saskatchewan, uh, but U.S., of course, but then if you see in Africa where Ruth is from or down in South America, uh, you see very little nitrogen fertilizer use. And so we have the problem that in many, reasons, in many regions of the world it's overused and in other re regions of the world it's underused. And yet when we add nitrogen fertilizer, we know it's relatively inefficient. And so maybe uh, no more than 50% of the nitrogen fertilizer that's added actually ends up in the plant. A lot of it is lost and a lot of that comes out as runoff and that can have deleterious effects on the environment and including coming off as gaseous products, which can also have deleterious effects on the climate. An example of this always pointed to is the impact in the, uh, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico here in the Gulf of California from runoff uh, from agricultural lands, which causes eutrophication, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, and, and so on and so forth. And again, there, there is a cost for, uh, for inaction. In this case, these are actually dollars. This is data from Europe. Uh, showing in the left-hand side the cost in, to the European Union in billions of euros um, of, to the effect of nitrogen pollution, either on human health, ecosystem, or climate. So again, um, a lot of our politicians say if we don't do anything, it's not going to cost us anything, but of course there are these hidden costs, and these are costs to government, they're costs to industry, there's costs to society. And a lot of people perhaps think that we've, we've overdone it from the standpoint of uh, taking care of the planet. This is an interesting article in Nature that basically says that from the standpoint of the, the nitrogen cycle, we've exceeded the um, balance uh, from the state of uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, and also human interference with the nitrogen cycle. So we're not being good stewards of our, of our, of our planet, at least from the standpoint of uh, the nitrogen cycle. So. That's kind of the problem. Uh, how do we mitigate that challenge? One is diet, dietary, dietary choice. If we move from animal uh, uh, food to more plant products, uh, that would be beneficial. But uh, with the exception perhaps of California, most every place else is going in the opposite direction. Um, and that is that at, we see as developing countries become more developed, they switch more and more to meat products uh, for, their, for their diet. Examples in Asia, I was just in Asia a few days ago, uh, where as um, society gets more affluent, uh, rice consumption goes down and the production and the uh, consumption of animal protein goes up. I was mentioned, um, Maurice mentioned the idea of uh, food waste. But there's a number of things that we could do in agriculture from the standpoint of nitrogen use efficiency, and some of that includes the use of uh, intelligent use of nitrogen fixation, which is what I'm here to talk to you about. So if we look then at what uh, is extant now in agriculture, of course, legumes are very, very important, but there's really only about 15 legumes that are grown very widely. That red circle represents the nitrogenase enzyme, which is actually the enzyme in bacteria that fixes nitrogen. Biological nitrogen fixation is strictly a prokaryotic process, but that means that it can only be carried out by bacteria, and therefore if eukaryotes, uh, such as plants, uh, carry out nitrogen fixation, they have to do it in conjunction uh, with bacteria. And on the left there is, uh, is root nodules growing on a, on a legume. And of course, when we're looking at legumes, soybean is king. It's the number one uh, legume grown worldwide. It's a plant, that, of course, that I work on. But if you look at soybean production, it's primarily three major countries, U.S., Brazil, and Argentina, although clearly, as we heard, there's increasing production in other parts of the world, such as in Africa. 
Now, if we look at other kinds of things, of course, we also have forage legumes such as alfalfa, and uh, one of the trends that's uh, occurring now in the U.S. is uh, using a lot more cover crops, and that would include things like alfalfa, and that can also contribute significantly to soil health and to agriculture in general, as well as serving as a forage for animal production. And then we also had mentioned earlier the idea that there can be nitrogen carryover from these legumes, and so there's an indirect effect, especially when we use these in crop rotations, where nitrogen fixation occurs in the legume crop, and then the subsequent crops, such as wheat or corn, can utilize that nitrogen. Here's an example. This, this is a slide from Mark Peoples in uh, CSIRO, and they estimate, based on data from Australia, North America, and Europe, that if you follow um, um, with wheat after, after a legume, and the legumes are shown there in the upper left, you can get an extra 1.2 tons of wheat per hectare due to that nitrogen carryover. So legumes have this uh, tradition of being able to enrich the soil, and so using rotation in this way as a way in which nitrogen fixation directly benefits now, not in the future, uh, agricultural production. But we also have to think in terms of the fact that there's great diversity out there in the number of nitrogen fixing symbioses. Uh, we only use just a few of those, and so there's also an opportunity perhaps to tap in to many of these other legumes, and so there's about 18,000 species of legumes. Now, not all of those are nodulated, not all of those fix nitrogen, but many of them do. And so these unexploited legumes can be an untapped tool for genetic diversity, and perhaps more needs to be done in maybe utilizing these in crop rotations or as, as cover crops or ways to increase uh, soil fertility. Okay, now um, the other thing is inoculation. So here is a slide from uh, Mary Angela Hungria in Brazil. Again, similar to what I showed you. The first slide, soybean plants either are inoculated, which are the darker colors, or uninoculated. Um, and so uh, Brazil uh, soybean production benefited by the importation of rhizobium inoculant from the United States when uh, uh, production of soybean took off in Brazil, say, roughly 50 years ago. And here's an example again from Mary Angela. I, I don't know how um, current these numbers are, but in this slide she says that uh, nitrogen fixation in soybean brings about 6 million tons of nitrogen into Brazilian soils. And according to her, only about 2.9 million tons of nitrogen of fertilizer are used. And so there's twice as much nitrogen being added to Brazilian soils by nitrogen fixation than by the use of, uh, uh, use of fertilizer. That wouldn't be the case, for instance, in the United States. And here's a, another slide from her on inoculation. And so there is a lot of efforts into Africa, as in other ones that's being funded by the Gates Foundation, of actually trying to move inoculate technology into developing countries. Here's some examples in cowpea, where the, the bars that are higher are those in which there's been inoculants uh, brought in from Brazil and tried in these, um, in these uh, sites. And so there's a, a long history of this as I said, from the U.S. into Brazil about 50 years ago and, and now in other places. But, but there remains problems from the standpoint of inoculant quality and uh, access to, to inoculants. And I know that into Africa, for instance, Ken Giller, this is one of the things that he's focused on in Africa. So it, re it remains a problem. But this is kind of a low-cost effort that can have a, a big significant impact if it's, if it's done properly. Now, there actually has, uh, many of you may think that inoculant technology is quite old, and so it's, it's stayed the same over time, but that's not true. This just shows one example of that in the inoculant carriers. So when you add an inoculant, you add it as a carrier. The carrier makes it easier for the farmer to apply, <clears throat> but it also extends the life of the inoculant. So prior, if you look down at the bottom right, in 1990, liquid um, carriers came around. Prior to 1990, if you were in the inoculant business, you never knew what your profit was until the end of the season, because what you would do is that you would sell your product to the various outlets in the, uh, in the winter, and then it would get sold to the farmers, but you would have a buyback program, and that is at the end of the, end of the season, if there was any inoculant that wasn't bought, your company would buy that back. And the reason why you did that was to maintain quality because it didn't have a long shelf life. And so that was a very difficult business product not to know what your profit was until, until you actually bought back the product. And, uh, but in the liquid inoculant came around 
that gave it a much longer shelf life, made it easier to supply, and was a, a big boon to, to the inoculant industry. Now, I've worked with companies such as Novozymes on some other technology. Uh, this is the so-called uh, LCO, which stands for lipokaido oligosaccharide technology. A couple of our patents are behind, behind this. Um, the LCO basically is the structure on the bottom right. It's a lipokaido oligosaccharide molecule. It's basically the primary signal that rhizobium use to actually initiate nodulation on the plant. And I won't go into the, the, the dirty details of this, but this shows a, a slide where in the center there at the top, the LCO is recognized by receptors by the plant and then triggers this nodule development on the right-hand side. The other thing which has come about out of this, this kind of research, which is quite interesting, is that these LCOs are also signals that are used by mycorrhizae. And they're now, we know that this kind of straight line going down the middle represents a common pathway, which is used not only by nodulation, but also by mycorrhizae. And this is important, as I'll talk to you in a few minutes, about efforts to actually create, say, nitrogen-fixing corn. And the idea there is, since corn is already mycorrhizal, this central pathway already exists in corn. And so if we were to try to develop a nodulated corn, all we'd have to do is add, say, the ability to recognize the nod factor and perhaps the ability to form this nodule structure. But this central pathway, which is in common between rhizobium and nodulation, we wouldn't have to engineer into the corn plant. And here's an example from a recent paper from my lab where we've actually shown that this LCO actually has activity on other plants such as corn. And in this case, we're showing that the LCO increases root, root growth on, on corn. So there maybe is a possibility for using these type of gr uh, plant growth uh, promoting chemicals uh, as ways to stimulate um, not only legumes but also non-legumes. And I believe that Novozymes is actually has a product or is working on a product that could be applied to maize. So, if we then look at world food production, you know, most world food production is in cereals, and so I've been talking about pulses, and we can get nitrogen from pulses for cereals from, from carryover uh, during rotation, but can we do anything directly for cereals to get cereals to fix nitrogen? And here, again, here are the major cereals that are produced, and uh, of course, wheat here in Saskatchewan is very important. <clears throat> there was an interesting paper, this is, comes from J.K. Lada, who some of you may know, who has been with Erie for many, many years. And in this paper, I, I recommend that you look at it. Um, uh, what, what they did is that they did a meta-analysis, which means that they didn't do any new experiments, they just looked at what was already in the literature. And they looked at using nitrogen balance studies in maize, rice, and wheat over the last 50 years. And so they measured, you know, the amount of nitrogen that was in the seed, they measured the amount of nitrogen that was in, um, in the soil, and, and so on and so forth. And they came, they came up that roughly 24% of the nitrogen that was in the crop could not be accounted for by those sources. And so they, they suggested that that 24% was actually coming from associative nitrogen fixation. So if these figures are true, it means that in cereals globally over the last 50 years, a biological nitrogen fixation has indeed played an important agricultural role, although one that, one that uh, people have not really focused on. And these numbers are really not much different than numbers that you see in sugarcane in Brazil, which has always been put up as kind of the model of where associative nitrogen fixation is playing a role. And I call it associative nitrogen fixation because it's not the typical kind of rhizobium nodulation, kind of intimate symbiosis that you see where you form a unique structure, a nodule on the roots. Uh, in this case, the bacteria colonize the plant, fix the nitrogen, but there's no uh, physical structure um, that's formed, and they're not intracellular, they're intercellular. <clears throat> and here's some data from Michael Lavardi at the Nobel Foundation where they've also looked at switchgrass as a bioenergy crop, and they've used the settling reduction, which is a surrogate for looking at nitrogen fixation, and have found significant amount of, uh, of fixation in switchgrass. And there's been some um, long-term uh, studies, one of which was at Rothamsted, uh, where they've actually looked at these kind of bioenergy crops with very low inputs over very long periods of time, and as further evidence that there, there in fact, there is, is significant levels of nitrogen fixation uh, occurring in these plants. Although mechanistically we know very, very little about this, it, um, the anecdotal evidence indicates that it doesn't exist and it can be very important. <clears throat> 
Now, the bacteria that carry out this associative nitrogen fixation are members of the so-called plant growth promoting rhizo rhizobacteria, PGPRs. <clears throat> and they, um, they fix nitrogen but can also have uh, plant growth promoting properties uh, via other kinds of mechanisms. And one of the things that's been happening in the industry, um, say over the last 10 years, uh, certainly over the last five years, is kind of a reinvigoration of the whole idea of biologicals. Uh, biologicals being these kinds of bacteria, these kind of biological treatments that you can add to plants. And you might think that this is being driven by the science, and certainly there is good science there, but a lot of it's actually being driven by changes in the industry. Example is seed treatments. And so in the U.S., for instance, um, uh, now it's quite common, for instance, if you buy soybean, um, uh, you actually get a seed treatment, say fungicide, and that seed treatment is added at the co-op. And so the farmer then very easily can just call up the co-op, order the seed, and have the seed treatment applied. And that removes the hassle of him having to add the inoculant uh, on when he's on the tractor. And that's made acceptance of these kinds of biologicals much, uh, uh, a lot more acceptance of these kinds of biologicals simply because they're easier to apply. And I think the major companies are seeing this and you're seeing major companies buy up these kinds of biological focused uh, companies uh, or enter into uh, um, uh, agreements such as Monsanto with Novozymes. And there clearly are products that are coming out. Now these biologicals are just starting to be used, uh, in, say, in North America. But in South America, where I go and, and consult uh, quite often, uh, there is a, quite a thriving industry in some of these PGPRs. <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned to you, these uh, plant growth promoting bacteria can colonize both the surface of the plant, but also get inside the plant, get to very high numbers, say up to the 10 to the 10th uh, per gram tissue, but don't elicit any kind of innate immunity response. So they're not seen by the plant as pathogens, and again, can be quite beneficial to the growth of the plant. An example of such a bacterium is azospirillum which is a nitrogen-fixing PGPR, and there is, in fact, commercial inoculant sold in South America um, uh, that's applied to uh, sugarcane, wheat, corn, and, and some other crops. Um, it's not widely used, I mean, it's not, uh, but it's, uh, it is a significant market, and, and some of the major companies are selling these inoculants. Um, here's an example of some data from a colleague of mine, Fabio Pedrosa, which is in uh, southern Brazil in um, uh, Curitiba. And it shows here that um, if, you add, if you look at the controls versus the, the far right where, where they've added a bit of nitrogen, a, a limiting amount of nitrogen as well as this inoculant, they're getting significant increase in yield. And again, one of the effects of this is to increase root growth and in fact a common effect of adding these bacteria is to increase root growth. And that also has other beneficial effects, for instance, by making the plant more drought tolerant. Now we've been interested in this uh, to follow more the mechanism because a lot of this, uh, a lot of the work that's been published has been more phenomenology, and there's been a lot of um, skepticism about uh, the use of these uh, kinds of treatments. And a lot of that skepticism has come from, I think, a lack of understanding of the mechanism, but also the fact that it's um, kind of hit or miss. You know, this field would work well, the other field it doesn't work, and we really don't know uh, what's behind all that variability. So we've tried to develop. <clears throat> a model system, and this is uh, Ceteria, which is a C4 weed, basically, but it's closely related to some of the bioenergy grasses, and uh, we've been uh, using this as a model system. And, and uh, we've been looking at this from the standpoint of using these PGPR bacteria, such as Azospirillum, Herbospirillum, and another one called Azoarchus. The Herbospirillum and Azoarchus are endophytes, and Azospirillum is an is a epiphyte. It grows on the surface of the roots. And uh, in a paper that we published in Plant Journal, and I, I recommend it to you, where we, we used um, working with people up at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, we were able to use N13, which has a half-life of 10 minutes, and C11, which has a half-life of 20 minutes, to look at the effects of uh, inoculation on nitrogen fixation, but also on the overall physiology of the plant. And uh, what's come out of that is that when we inoculate uh, these plants with uh, normal wild type bacteria, we can show that about 7% of their daily nitrogen requirement is provided by nitrogen fixation. And so using these radioisotope, we can show that the nitrogen is fixed, we can show that it's transported in the plant, we can show it's incorporated into protein. But 7% is probably not really agronomically relevant. 
But if we use another bacteria, in this case is a bacteria that fixes nitrogen but excretes ammonia, and this is a mutation in the enzyme glutamine synthetase, we actually find much higher levels of fixation, and now we can provide 16-fold higher levels of nitrogen, and that level is actually sufficient to provide all of the nitrogen for the plant's daily nitrogen demand. And that's shown in this figure here. If you look on the left, is the ceteria growing with sufficient nitrogen, 5 millimolar nitrate. Uh, the second from the left shows the uninoculated culture growing under limited nitrate. And then if you go all the way to the far right, you'll see these are plants growing under limited nitrogen, but inoculated with this nitrogen excreting uh, bacteria. And sh you can see that the growth of that plant is uh, basically equivalent to the one that's growing with combined nitrogen. Now, although these are glasshouse and greenhouse, uh, uh, glasshouse experiments, and I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't say that we can take them into the field, I think it does show the potential that there is the potential then for these bacteria to be used actually in, a, in an agriculturally significant way uh, to fix nitrogen and allow plants, plants to grow. The other, perhaps the most uh, compelling uh, data from that paper is if you look on the far left, this shows the distribution of various metabolites in plants growing under high levels of combined nitrogen. The center shows the same distribution under limiting nitrogen, and on the right, uh, it's growth of limiting nitrogen uh, inoculated with these bacteria. And I think you can just see by looking at the color distribution that the inoculated plants are much more similar to the plants grown under com high combined nitrogen than they are plants growing under limited nitrogen. So by all of these kinds of per parameters, including looking at the effects of metabolism, we can show the effects of nitrogen fixation and are having a significant impact um, on, on plant growth. So there's a lot of potential there, although it's still untapped. Now, how about biotechnology? And um, I, I didn't know the program when I put the slides together, but it's very interesting that we're about to have a, a discussion about biotechnology. This is from a review from 2014 written by um, a couple of friends of mine, Giles Orroy and, and Ray Dixon, who are very knowledgeable in this area. It, it also happens just coincidentally to um, uh, uh, re uh, refer to two projects that are funded by the Gates Foundation. So in the upper portion, that, that's meant to represent the uh, synthetic biology approach where you actually take the genes for nitrogen fixation out of the bacteria and actually express those genes in the mitochondria and therefore make the plant nitrogen fixing. And that is the plant will actually be expressing the enzymes for nitrogen fixation. The bottom, uh, the bottom example is the idea of uh, nodulated corn. That is, take the symbiotic system that exists in rhizobium and actually transfer it uh, to corn. <clears throat> and the, the latter one, the idea that we can actually carry out this uh, make nodulated corn, if you will, it comes from this rationale that now that we know a lot about how the plant is recognizing symbiotic signals, and inducing nodule formation, now we have the sufficient information to begin to engineer those kinds of traits into the maize plant. And again, I mentioned to you the fact that you have this commonality between nodulation and mycorrhizae, suggesting that you don't have to engineer every gene, that corn, since it's already mycorrhizal, already has many of those genes. And so Giles, for instance, and many colleagues are funded by the Gates Foundation to pursue this kind of avenue. The other thing to think about is that now as we know more and we've done more looking at the diversity of these kinds of symbioses, we find on the far left, example being alfalfa, that it's a very sophisticated kind of mechanistic um, uh, system that leads to the symbiosis. But there's other systems such as uh, susp suspania, which is a nodulated tree in the middle, and where it's a much, much more simple kind of system and we don't seem to have the same kind of degree of complexity. And then all the way to the right, uh, which rec is rec um, represented by some, uh, some uh, trees, uh, tropical trees like Ascanomini, you can actually have a system where you can dispense with all this kind of nod factor LCO technology and actually just get direct infection of the plant and still get sufficient nitrogen fixation. And so it's possible then using these kinds of, of systems as models as opposed to say alfalfa, we might actually be able to engineer a nitrogen fixing corn by adding much fewer functions than what was otherwise um, realized until a few years ago. Now, getting back then to the, the synthetic approach, um, I did work on this when I was a postdoc um, many years ago. And um, we now know all the genes involved in nitrogen fixation. We know their function. 
the center there, B, represents the crystal structure of the enzyme that carries out nitrogen fixation. It's composed of, uh, of basically two subunits. One is a molybdenum iron protein and the other is an iron sulfur protein, uh, one being the, uh, the iron protein being NIF-H, the molybdenum iron protein actually being uh, encoded by two genes, NIF-K and D. The, one of the difficulties with these proteins from the standpoint of engineering them into, say, corn, is that um, in addition to the genes, the structural genes for the proteins for nitrogenase, you have to build these metal clusters. And so you have to build the four iron, four sulfur cluster, you have to build this so-called P cluster, and then the very difficult one is this FIMOCO uh, cluster, which is unique to nitrogenase. It doesn't really exist anywhere else. And so there's a number of genes that are required just to make those metal clusters and insert those into the proteins, and that's, that's a huge challenge. But there's uh, active work in this area, and again, uh, uh, some of this is funded by the Gates Foundation. This is a, a paper from Chris Voigt that was in PNAS, where they showed using very, very engineering practices, real synthetic biology, that they can refactor this uh, nitrogenase gene cluster in such a way that they can control it precisely and express these uh, proteins and also optimize nitrogen fixation. Now, this wasn't done in, entirely in bacteria. A very interesting paper came out, this should be 2016, not 2015, in Nature Communication, and this again is from a group that's funded by the Gates Foundation. And where, what they did is they took one of the proteins, NIF-H, which again requires one of these iron sulfur clusters, and actually expressed it in mitochondria in yeast, and were able to show that they could actually uh, uh, retrieve active nitrogenase protein out of yeast. And since that required the iron sulfur cluster, and since they didn't add the enzymes to make that iron sulfur cluster, it indicates that that NIF-H protein was actually able to use the iron sulfur clusters that are normally made in mitochondria in order to reconstitute the active protein, suggesting again that perhaps we can make this nitrogenase by adding fewer genes than we otherwise thought we could. Now, of course, the NIF-H protein is much easier than actually making the molybdenum iron uh, uh, protein, which is still a challenge. Um, one of the other things to keep in mind is that nitrogenase is inherently extremely oxygen sensitive, and so if it's exposed to any oxygen at all, it loses activity. And so there's a, a number of, of challenges that, uh, that remain. But this still is a landmark in the fact that we've taken the first step to actually be able to do this synthetically in yeast, and of course if you can do it in yeast, you can probably do it in corn. Now, uh, a recent paper some of you may have missed was a paper in science, which is really very exciting. And a, a, one of the things about nitrogen fixation is it's very energy uh, requiring, but it also requires a lot of reductant. And that reductant, of course, is provided in, in bacteria by, you know, by uh, uh, electron donors like uh, ferrodoxin and, and flavodoxin. Um, and then that goes into the NIF-H protein, which is the center glob, and then the NIF-H protein transfers those electrons to the molybdenum iron protein. Now, in this paper, what they did was really exciting. They took a cadmium sulfur nanorod using nanotechnology, and they actually bound that to the proteins, and they could then shine light on that system and actually use light to provide the electrons to support nitrogen fixation. Now, that doesn't get around the issue of oxygen sensitivity, but if this could actually be scaled up, then um, instead of using natural gas like we do now to make synthetic nitrogen, we could actually use light to drive uh, the production of ammonia for fertilizer production. So it's quite an exciting finding. On the top panel there shows the natural system and where the reductant and electrons are coming from from ATP and electron donors inside the cell, and the bottom then uh, represents this new system and where the electrons are actually coming from light that's being absorbed by these nanoparticles, these cadmium sulfur nanorods. And on the left here, you can see the century-old Haber-Bosch process, which is the process by which we now make synthetic nitrogen. It uses about 3 to 5 percent of the global nat natural gas consumption, <clears throat> which represents about 1 to 2 percent of the glo global energy usage. And so there's a huge carbon footprint for synthetic nitrogen fertilizer production. Now, on the right then represents this new system that could actually use light. Now, that doesn't get around a lot of the environmental effects of ammonia because it's still if you're going to add ammonia as a fertilizer, you're going to have runoff, you're going to have a lot of these other kinds of effects but it would greatly reduce the carbon footprint of, um, 
of uh, synthetic uh, nitrogen fertilizer production. But again, there's huge challenges from a paper from science to an industrial scale process, and not, not the least of which is you've got to be able to protect the enzyme from, from oxygen, as I mentioned. But still, uh, an exciting, um, exciting paper and a, a, a nice demonstration of the use of these kinds of new technologies. So, some final personal thoughts and recommendations. So, I hope I've convinced you that biological nitrogen fixation is and will continue to contribute to sustainable food production. I hope I've also con convinced you that progress is being made along a wide front, all the way from, you know, the use of, uh, of legumes and cropping systems to trying to develop uh, uh, nitrogen-fixing corn to even industrial processes where we can actually fix nitrogen using light. Uh, one of the, the um, complaints that I've always had is that if you talk to the major corporations, you know, they want one rhizobium that can inoculate every soybean in the world. Um, but we know because of genotype and environment interactions, there's a lot of variability. E example, when we've done our work with PGPR and we screen a variety of genotypes of a given species, we find that only about 10% of the genotypes that we, we screen actually respond to the PGPR. And so that means that 90% of the plants that are out there, probably because of the, the way they've been bred for nitrogen response, either don't have or have lost this ability to respond to PGPR. And so um, that may in fact be a significant um, driver of this variability that we see in the field when these kinds of technologies are trying to be uh, applied. There are some relatively low, uh, low tech and cost solutions. An example is improvement of inoculant quality and performance, which I mentioned into Africa is trying to do this in Africa now, and there's been other, other um, uh, ideas behind this, uh, perhaps also involving a, a wider range of legume species and crop rotations. Is nitrogen fixing corn feasible? Um, I personally think that the synthetic biology approach is probably uh, quite feasible. The nodulated corn I'm a little bit more skeptical of, but who knows, the people that are doing it are very bright, and I'm sure that they'll achieve it if it's achievable. But then you have to ask the question about economic viability. About 30% of the, of the photosynthate of a soybean plant goes into the nodules to support nitrogen fixation. So if you had, actually had a corn plant that fixed nitrogen, then one would assume about 30% of its photosynthate would actually go to nitrogen fixation, which one would assume would reduce the yield of the corn plant. Um, and so there's a question about its economic viability. And then uh, I've, had, I've gone up to many farmers in the U.S. and said, you know, if I can increase your profitability at the cost of yield, would you agree to it? And without, a, without a hesitation, they've all said, absolutely not. So farmers in developing countries will not give up yield. And the reason why they won't give up yield is that they know year in and year out, regardless of environmental conditions, if they focus on yield, they're probably going to do all right. If they focus on other kinds of things, then there could, they could actually have a bad year. So if that's true, if we can't get farmers in developing countries to take a corn plant that fixes its own nitrogen but at a decrease of yield, then that then limits what's possible, how it can be funded. And again, the projects that I told you about are funded by the Gates Foundation, not by the National Science Foundation and where also they might be applied. And so, so th this may actually be a boon, say, to developing agriculture, but perhaps not be um, well accepted in developing countries. And then uh, agriculture, including biological nitrogen fixation, is in great need of significant increase in research funding if we're going to meet the needs of sustainable food production in such a way that we protect our environment and our way of life. And again, I think our, our politicians um, think that there's no cost to inaction and also, at least in the U.S., I think, f view agriculture as a situation of excess and not a situation of limitation. And so we have a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, pushing the rock up the hill, I think, to, uh, to really increase the amount of funding that we get um, for agriculture. But, but these kinds of meetings and the kind of discussions we're having here, I think, are very important. So I just want to, one final slide to show our who, the kind of people that have funded our research and on the left there, the, the people, the names of the people that are in my lab now. And before I end, I wanted to thank uh, Mark Peoples, Mike Lavardi, Perry Gustafson, and Mary Angela Hungria, who shared very generously of some of the slides and uh, some of which I was able to show you uh, today. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you.
very interesting uh, and intriguing uh, paper, uh, Doctor. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing that with us. Lauren Hepworth of the Global Institute for Food Security. Would you care to look into your crystal ball and speculate on timelines when some of this really interesting stuff might be uh, commercially <coughs> viable and available? Well, you know, from the standpoint of the cad cadmium sulfur thing, I think you need somebody more from in, in the industry that can argue to that because I, I, I could see it taking a long time to upscale that kind of technology. For, uh, uh, some years ago, when the Gates Foundation was considering these kinds of things, I, was, I went to a meeting in, in Seattle at the Gates Foundation. And um, at that time, I thought that they were looking at what to fund. And at that time, I thought they would fund associative nitrogen fixation because, as I explained to you, it's kind of a system that already exists naturally. And so for it to, to increase its agricultural acceptance, we just need to kind of enhance it. Um, but, in fact, in the, but, but in fact, what came out on top at that Gates Foundation meeting was actually the synthetic biology approach, that after we saw the science behind it and the new technologies coming around, we thought that if anything was going to work, it was probably the synthetic biology approach. And I still think that that's probably true. And so, you know, we may, we may only be 10 years or maybe even less from away from a nitrogen-fixing yeast. And uh, that's the model system that they're using. And of course, a nitrogen fixing yeast by itself, let's say, let's use a nitrogen fixing yeast to, uh, with, to make uh, dry distiller greens, for instance, and which would probably greatly increase the nitrogen content, make it a much better animal feed, for example. So there's big usages for nitrogen fixing yeast. Uh, but of course, if you can do it in yeast, you can probably do it in, in corn. The question then really comes in that if, it, that let's say if we had nitrogen fixing corn in 20 years, um, is it really economically viable? And you know that's the kind of question you probably can't answer until you actually do it. And you know, see if you know if the, if the plant is only three inches tall when you get done, um, you know, it's not very useful. But maybe another ten years of optimizing it, you know, can get it up to where to where it's actually um, you know production scale. So, so I I think nitrogen fixing corn, you know, twenty to thirty years off nitrogen fixing yeast much closer. Um, the nodulated corn thing, um, if Giles was standing here, I'd say, well, you know, probably he's not here, so I'd say, mm, I'm a little skeptical of that. But, uh, but, uh, but, you know, Giles and the other people are working with him, these are some of the brightest people that I know. So, so there are no doubt they're going to find very interesting things, and if it can be done, they'll, they'll accomplish it, I'm sure. Johannes de Bruyne published the article in the 70s about uh, tropical grasses fixing nitrogen. The mechanism of uh, corn fixing nitrogen the same that she explained 40 years ago? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I know Joanna and I know many of her papers. I don't know exactly which one you're talking about. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the nitrogenase enzyme is the same. And in sugarcane, there's this bacteria called gluconoacetobacter, which actually grows in the leaves and, and uh, actually grows under very high sugar concentration and is thought to be responsible for most of the nitrogen fixation that goes on there. Where we're really, you know, and I mentioned in the case of uh, the rhizobium, we know enough about the mechanism now that people are postulating actually transferring that from one plant to another. Unfortunately, the research on associated nitrogen fixation is lagged, and so we don't have the same level of understanding. We don't have the level of understanding of what uh, compounds are being exchanged, uh, what nutrients are being exchanged. We don't really understand the signaling that's taking place. We don't really understand the infection mechanism by which these bacteria can get in and become endophytes. And so this is one of the reasons we're trying to develop a model system uh, where we can start to tear this apart both biochemically and genetically. And, and we're making some progress, and I think other people are interested in doing the same thing. So it's, it's surprising that it's took, taken so long to kind of mainstream uh, science to, to get back and start asking these basic questions, but, but you know, better late than never. Good times here. Happy to meet you again. We were in the same taxi yesterday. <laughs> I didn't know I was sitting next to yeah, you. Yeah, I was asleep. It was like 12, 12 yeah. midnight, yeah. This is really exciting stuff, but what is really good also is in, uh, in Africa, we can make a lot of progress with current technology. Right, that's you right. Are, you were using your crystal, crystal ball question. We can move a lot. We are currently with the Into Africa project actually producing inoculants based on sterile <coughs> peat in Nigeria. Right. We sold $50,000 of packs last year for soybean. And what we've seen really, and what is really interesting, is soybean also needs phosphor. And phosphor is costly. No, because inoculant is so cheap, 
it's actually valorizing the investment in phosphor. In a sense, you could argue the fertilizer company should give the inoculant for free when they, when they sell, sell the phosphor fertilizer for legume production. So it's just more of a comment. The second comment I wanted to make is, you said there is less money for agriculture since 2005 or something. Well, I, I didn't say less. I'm just saying there hasn't been a huge increase. But there, is, there is a big change, and Professor Lal also said, you know, the yields are still one ton per hectare as they used to be 30 years ago. You can look at it with pessimistic glasses or with optim optimistic glasses. If you put on your pessim pessimistic glasses, this is what you say. If you look at your, with your optimistic glasses, you see a lot of progress in a lot of countries. The current yield in Ethiopia is now three tons per hectare for maize, not more one ton. Nigeria and Malawi are using almost 30 to 50 kilograms of fertilizer. So there is a lot of change, and that change is, is not a secret. If you look at where that change is happening, it's where governments are investing in agriculture. It's, it's not like a mystery. So there is a lot more money for agriculture in Africa. Not everywhere, not all the time, but these good examples are there. I just wanted to make that comment also that we don't leave this room being, you know, desperate to you know what we can do. There is a lot that is, that is currently happening. And with a bit more effort, that can actually probably double and triple in the next 10 years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't have any trouble getting up in the morning and going to work, so I'm, I'm optimistic too. Uh, uh, biologicals can also help with the phosphate situation because there certainly are phosphate solubilizing bacteria as well as fungi. And I know there's actually companies here in Canada that fun, sell fungi, for instance, for phosphate solubilization. So that's another place where biologicals can play a role. This one working, yeah. And we do have a roving mic if people who are hemmed in a little bit need to, to ask a question. Gary, thank you so much for that. And uh, there's a lot of pro provocative science in there. Um, the, the, the suspicion that things like sugarcane were actually fixing nitrogen by uh, epiphytic means uh, or endophytic means, uh, 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 raises the question as to whether we would ever be able to harness a process like that and intervene. Could you give us a, a sense as to what you think are the key discoveries that need to be made in order to give us a clue as to whether we could actually intervene and use a process like that as, you know, uh, as an alternative to nodulation? What are the key things we need to know? Well, you know, from, from the optimistic point of view, I mean, that, the technology is already being used. So I showed you some data from uh, Fabio Pedrosa and with the azosprillum. But he, even he will admit that they see a significant impact of inoculation on sandy soils, which I take to be low nutrient soils. And even in our lab, if we have a plant that's growing under significant nitrogen, very healthy, we don't see any impact of inoculation of the bacteria. So these seem to be uh, working primarily under stress conditions and under low nutrient uh, conditions, but in those conditions, you can get a consistent response, and you know the inoculant is being sold and is having a positive impact. Um, it's hard for me to answer the the real your real question simply because we know so little about these interactions and what's involved and mechanistically what's going on. So we really don't know what's limiting. And quite frankly, in most of the cases, we don't really have a clear idea of what's causing plant growth promotion. Uh, you know, a lot of it's been attributed to things like cytokine and auxin, other cases nitrogen fixation, other cases biocontrol, et cetera, et cetera. And it may be all of the above, but the kind of the, the mechanistic studies just haven't been done. To close. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much, Gary, for that fascinating presentation. And now we're going to have a coffee break, so please be back sharp at 3.30 for this very interesting IQ squared debate. Thank you. Yes, and before everybody uh, leaves the room, uh, the IQ squared debate is in a different uh, um, a, a, a different hall, um, which is down the far end of the corridor, and then you'll have to go down the stairs. If you can try and take your seats within 10 minutes of the start of the debate, that will give us an opportunity to get everybody who is a registered uh, conference attendee seated, because some of the general public will also be coming for the debate. So uh, let's see if we can get everybody down there by about 10 minutes before the debate starts. Thank you. <laughs>